excited to welcome to the show tonight, Dr. Corey Moreau. Corey is a scientist who I've known for God, like seven years now. Um, she used to work at the Field Museum. She now works at Cornell. And she is a truly awesome person. And she studies ants. Yes, I do. <laughs> she does. It's true. Uh, we were just noting, too, on Twitter the other day um, that you're part of a women in science communication group. And that yesterday, a bunch of folks were tweeting about you. So if you go to Corey's Twitter page, you will see so many nice comments that like we were saying it reads like a like she died that it's yeah. like I don't think that anybody will have that many nice things to say about me at my own funeral and people were just saying this nice stuff about Corey on a Monday because it's all very true Corey is a really really awesome and inspirational scientist um, who's done a lot for um, diversity in STEM and helping us better understand uh, some of the most important animals on the planet that we don't always think about. I so, more. <laughs> so to start out with, uh, Corey, you study ants. Uh, what is an ant? Well, that's a good question. So as you mentioned, ants are animals, and I know a lot of people don't think of insects as animals, but they are. Um, and ants are a, a type of insect, which means they essentially have six legs or three pairs of legs. They have three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Um, and in the case of ants, they're nested within a group called, an order called the Hymenoptera, which are the ants, bees, and wasps. So sort of some of the more familiar insects you probably know. And so ants, some of the unique characteristics of them is that they have these antenna that are elbowed, which is why it kind of looks like they're sort of always pointed in front of their head. They have a long sort of segment of their antenna that helps them sort of stay oriented to the front. And then between their thorax and their abdomen, they have a really tight constriction or waist, which is also another defining character of them, which allows them to have flexibility to move their abdomen. Gotcha. And so when I was doing uh, some research in advance of this talk to get a sense of what people know about ants and are curious about ants, and by research, I mean asking my younger sister, and she had a lot of questions that were mostly a bug's life centric from the Disney Pixar. I should note also, she's 27 years old, so this is not a child. Uh, and uh, so yeah, she was asking me uh, some real hardball questions and I realized that I don't know dick about ants. Uh, so what do ants eat? Like they like sugar and picnics, but like what's an ant's life really like? Yeah, so maybe it won't be surprising to know that not all ants are the same. So there are more species of ants than all the birds and mammals added together. So that means that with all of that diversity it means that there's a lot of, of um, different ways that they behave, a lot of different diets. So some ants are entirely predatory and eat nothing but other animals. Some ants are entirely herbivorous and only eat plant-based diets, they're essentially vegans. And then some are omnivorous in between, are much more like us, they eat a little of everything. So the ants that we see here in Chicago, and I'm guessing we have folks in other places too on the chat, you can write in where you're from, that'll be exciting for Noah to sift through. Um, like when I go outside and going outside, what a concept. Uh, when I go outside and see an ant, usually they're just the little dark brown, black ants. Sometimes we got like the ones that are like real big, juicy boys. Like, are those all the same kind of ants? Like, yeah, definitely not. So, I mean, I can already tell you because I've spent time in Chicago, the little ones you're seeing in the sidewalk that's probably a species of tetramorium is the pavement ant. The big juicy ones that you refer to are a type of carpenter ant, uh, but they're actually not boys. So you refer to them as the juicy boys that you see. <laughs> so interestingly, almost every ant anyone has ever seen uh, who's joining us today, almost every single ant has been female. So interestingly within an ant colony, the the structuring of the colony is much more female dominated. So in this situation, Females do almost everything for the colony. They're the ones that are out defending the nest and waging battles in the sidewalk. They're the ones that are building the new tunnel, tunnels to make the nest very complex. They're the ones that are gathering food. Those are the ones that are caring for the brood or the larva. Those are the ones that are taking care of the queen. The males are only produced about once a year at the same time that the reproductive females are produced. And what happens then is that 
the female produces these sexual forms, so a new virgin queens and new males. And then when the environmental conditions are right, they leave the nest to go on their mating flights. So if you've ever seen an ant without wings, it's female. So wait, do all male ants have wings? Um, of course, there's always exceptions in nature. Do most male ants have yeah, wings? Yeah, I would say about 95% or 99% of ant species, the males actually have wings. And so it's a good way to know that, you know, what you're likely seeing, if they're actually contributing to the colony, if they're waging a battle or carrying food, that's definitely a female. Just like in human life. Um, but so tell me more about how ants are able to differentiate and only produce a small number of males. Like with most animals, it's kind of a 50, 50 chance. Um, yeah. But ants, it seems like they're able to preferentially select for having more females. That's right. So in the case of humans, right, the way that we reproduce is that you have a, a egg united with sperm. So some of your, you know, maternal or mother's DNA and some of your paternal or father's DNA, they're mixed together and then they form a new individual. And that makes us diploid. It means that we have a pair of chromosomes from each of our parents. Um, in the case of ants, they have an interesting reproductive biology. It's called haplodiploidy. And what that means is that if the queen, while laying an egg, actually unites it with sperm and makes it have two sets of chromosomes, it will become female. If she lays an egg and does not unite it with sperm, so it only has one set of chromosomes, it actually becomes male. So she can dictate when males are produced just by whether she unites sperm with the egg inside of her body. When you say when she unites sperm with the egg inside of her body, I think that we would all appreciate a little more clarity. <laughs> yeah. So interestingly, you know, it's funny because people often ask me like, oh, wouldn't you love to be the queen of an ant colony? And I actually think that's the worst job of all in an ant colony because the what happens after they go on their mating flight. So when the, you know, they have these reproductives in the colony and the environmental cues are right, the workers push the males and these new queens out. They fly off, they reproduce, and the males die almost right away. So they contribute to the colony only in the form of sperm. So they're essentially just making sure that the genetic um, diversity of the colony persists. But the queen now flies off. She mates with one or more males during that. And then she tries to find a new place to start a colony, digs down into the ground or wherever her nests is, are, and then just starts laying eggs. So she only mates once in her life. She never leaves the colony again. She never goes outside. So some queens can live for five years up to 35 years. And literally they just are egg-laying machines. And so coming back to your question about like, well, how do was an egg and a sperm unite? Um, the queen has a special organ in her body and lots of insects do. It's called a spermatheca. So when she mates with that one or more males, she stores her sperm in there and she can keep it viable or alive for up to 35 years and then keep drawing from that collection of sperm. When she runs out of sperm, she's done. There's no more sperm. She'll never mate again. When you say she's drawing from that collection of sperm, is she like dipping in there? Like literally, how's that happening? No, so it's, you know, it's part of the sort of reproductive tract. So just like in humans, you can imagine that, you know, whether you're male or female, you have different sort of connections through the reproductive tract. So whether it's the urethra is depositing, you know, different secretions and sperm to the package that leaves a male or versus a, a female where you have the oviduct that's landing the egg pass through the, you know, female reproductive tract. She essentially has this situation where the egg can pass through the reproductive tract and there's a little canal, which then either releases sperm or does not, that is controlled by her internal physiology. Gotcha. So she's, and then she's just got that sperm in her for years and years. Yeah. And it's that, actually interesting. The first ant genomes were partially sequenced because of that. And so they were actually sequenced by uh, a medical group and not because they were interested in ants per se, because ants are cool. They actually wanted to understand how is it that you can keep living cells alive at room temperature for dozens and dozens of years? Because as humans, we have to use cryogenic facilities. We have to use all these special chemicals. So yeah. we're to try to understand how does nature do it? Now, the beautiful thing is that they sequence these high quality genomes that lots of us now use as a resource. 
The downside of it is, of course, the genome doesn't tell you that. And so they still haven't solved that puzzle. So we still have no idea how to keep sperm viable, but we've learned more about the genetics of ants. So all in all, a win. Exactly. At least for me. Matt, and you're the only one I care about, so <laughs> that works. Um, so you've mentioned the queen now jam-packed full of cum is flying and she burrows down into the ground and just starts laying eggs. Like, and she's just creating a new ant colony from nothing or like, does she ever find an existing ant colony or are they, they're all her children? Yeah. So the majority of ants, they're all her children. There are a few species that um, have figured out that if you found a colony with other individuals, at least initially, that can be beneficial because it gives you access to more workers that can be gathering food. That certainly is not the, the sort of ground plan or the most common way. And then, of course, then you can go to extremes like things like army ants, where there, the way they reproduce is through budding. And what that means is that there's a resident queen who's there and laying eggs and has millions of individual workers with her. Then when a new queen is born in that time of year, what happens is that only one queen or maybe two if the resident queen is dying can go on. And so what happens is that the reason that that happens is they can only exist when they have lots of workers to help them because they don't dig into the ground and build a nest. They have temporary nests called bivouacs. So they have to take the, all the workers, divide them in half, and each marches in a different direction. So they each take 50% of all the workers with them to start their new colony. And that's why it's called budding. So in that situation, the queen has a whole bunch of her sisters with her initially, and then through time as her sisters are dying off, her own young are now coming up and becoming the, the soldiers and the workers. Yeah, and I've seen pictures of Bidwack. Like, it reminded me, there was a video game, I, what was it called, like Katamari Damacy, where everything, you just like roll all this shit up and you keep going in that fashion. Like, these are just swarms of so many ants all yeah. just kind of trundling <laughs> along. It's really remarkable. And it's funny because I'd always heard that you could, you could, knew you were approaching army ants because you could smell them. And I thought that that was just a myth until the first time I did field work in the tropics. And it literally, you can smell, there's so many individuals and they're all emitting their own sort of, you know, chemicals that they use to communicate that you can literally smell an army ant colony. What do they smell like? It's kind of acidic. I don't know how to explain okay. it. A little, a little sweet, but kind of acidic. Oh, that's, that's delightful and not what I was expecting. Okay, yeah, that works. I know people who um, have, like, I know there are kinds of edible ants that people rely on. And but yeah, I've heard they have kind of a pleasantly lemony taste. So Yeah, so some ants that people eat are, in fact, I can show you pictures. Yes, um, please. Let's see if I can find my pictures to show you guys. The first one I want to show you is actually this ant. So let me go back to my zoom and share screens. I so remember when my producer and best friend Noah and I once went to an Atlas Obscura event where we got to eat insects. Oh, it fun. Was, it was really cool and I enjoyed it. And I found out that the um, that caterpillars um, that have kind of a gusher-like uh, texture, mm -hmm. probably not for me, but <laughs> others are great. <laughs> I can appreciate that. So what you're looking at here, I think you can see this is a leaf cutter ant. Yep. So these ants actually are the world's first farmers or among the world's first farmers. Um, and so these are ants that are found in the, the new world. So from Mexico all the way through South America. And they're well known because they carry these parasols of leaves over their heads. And they actually go up and cut down bits of leaf to carry back to the nest. Um, and the reason they actually cut down bits of leaf is so that they can feed their colony. So here you can actually see some of them hard at work cutting off bits of the skin of this mango. And so they go out in the environment and collect all kinds of plant material. Um, and here you can see, can you see my cursor on the screen? Yeah. So here's the kind of a larger individual that has more powerful jaws that does most of the cutting. And then you can see some smaller individuals here that help when it gets down to the, the fine material. And then what they'll do is they'll carry that bit of leaf or mango skin back to the nest. They'll have other individuals grind it into a finer and finer pulp. 
And that's because they actually use it to grow a fungus or a mushroom. And the only food they eat is actually the fungus. So they actually grow their own mushrooms or their own farms. And they've been doing this for about 50 million years. So the reason I brought these up is that the queens of these come out in large numbers. So we were talking before about how in the reproductive biology, a whole bunch of queens leave the nest at once. In the case of the leafcutter ants, it can be tens of thousands at once. And so indigenous people from Mexico all the way through South America actually gather these queens when they come out. They're ginormous and they're super fatty and they fry them up and eat them. How big is ginormous, Corey? Are we talking a thumb or are we talking? Uh, yeah, so I would say that, you know, it's maybe like this much of your pinky. It's quite large. I mean, they can knuckle get- pinky? Yeah, exactly. From your knuckle, yeah, onward. They're huge. And they have a really kind of like nutty, fatty flavor. Have you tried them? Yes. Nice. Um, are they are they the they're best? They're crunchy and great. That, so like speaking to your point about like not eating the squirtier, mushier ones. I yeah, can't, yeah. If they've got a little crunch, I do better than also like you. Yeah. For sure. Um, I, and then the other group of ants that I wanted to share is actually um, this group of ants. Sorry, let me just switch um, pictures here. Um, these are called uh, weaver ants. Uh, and these are the green tree ants of Australia. And we'll talk a little bit about their cool biology in a minute. But these are ones that actually do taste incredibly lemony and people often use them to sprinkle on salads and they really have a true citrus flavor. But what makes this group of ants particularly cool is they have some really complex behavior where they cooperate to build a nest. So most ants you imagine live in sort of a soil nest underground, but these ants live entirely among living leaves of plants. But if you've ever been in any kind of a forest, you know the chances of all the leaves forming a nice secure nest is very small. So what they use is their larva. So you have to remember that ants and many other insects go through what's called metamorphosis. So just like a butterfly where there's a larva and then there's, you know, a pupa or, you know, and then or a chrysalis and then a, finally an adult, the same thing's true for ants. So these are all adult ants that you can see, but their larvae look like little fly maggots. They're just a little, essentially a sack with a mouth. They actually go through a, a pupal stage or a cocoon stage most species, but some species have actually foregone the cocoon and instead use the larval silk for other purposes. So in this case right here, what they do is individuals will grab two sides of a leaf and pull it together and then they'll use the larva to sew. And so this is actually all larval silk in this center section here. And that's what's actually gluing all the leaves together. You can see a bit of it here and all along here. And these leaf ants actually weave the leaves together and then live inside. I like this. These ants have the right idea. Put those kids to work. <laughs> Child labor laws are ruining our country. So <laughs> that's great. I'm happy to see that. Um, and you mentioned that um, one of the things that I really want to get into a little bit with ants, um, that they have all these complex behaviors, they're working together. And that fascinates me, um, that ants are really and truly communicating with each other. And I want to know more about that. Like, how, how smart are ants? Yeah. So it's interesting because no in individual ant is actually very intelligent. But together, they have something called collective intelligence. So all of these small miniaturized brains, and as a group, can actually perform these very complex tasks, like sewing leaves together, foraging for food, you know, building whole complex structures to live within. Um, and it's been a puzzle in science for a long time, sort of how do we get these individuals that do not necessarily have a whole lot of intellect individually, but can perform these very complex tasks. And I'll tell you that we have not entirely solved it. Um, one of the things that we do know is that for a while there had been this idea that if you miniaturize a brain so small, it literally cannot perform very complex um, jobs. And so we now know based on sort of all the rules of physics and neuroscience that ants break those rules. They can have really small brains and yet still perform these complex tasks. But in addition, because they have these lots of individuals who are not individually smart, but perform very complicated tasks, 
lots of robotics people have gotten really interested in studying social insects because you could imagine if you could have a whole group of robots that no individual is actually, you know, capable of thinking very intellectual thoughts, but as a group can perform very important functions, you might want to try to mirror that. So there's a whole bunch of robotics labs around the world that are actually trying to crack the sort of trick into having non-individually smart organisms, but perform these really complicated tasks. If only we could find a way to make groups of humans intelligent. That would be just, <laughs> what a game changer. That's kind of fun. So when they're communicating with each other, it's all pheromones, I'm told. But what really are pheromones? How does yeah, that work? So, yeah, so pheromones are just sort of bouquets of chemicals. So you can imagine that you smell one flower and it might smell really good to you and you can smell another flower and think that smells terrible. That's essentially what ants are doing. They're essentially creating chemical cocktails using all of these different glands inside their body to communicate. And that's part of the reason that their antenna are then elbowed forward. That's so that they can pick up scent communication and that it's always sort of oriented forward, but also gives them flexibility to sort of look at it in the environment. And so what they're essentially doing is they have alarm pheromones, they have appeasement pheromones, they have mechanisms to sort of recognize individuals from the same colony versus from different colonies. And it's all through this sort of pheromone or chemical communication. And so how do they translate that into something that is actionable? Like say I'm an ant and I have found a piece of a uh, strawberry that's been left out by a picnicker and I want all my friends to come and get that strawberry and bring pieces back to our colony. Right. That's a complicated thing to try to explain. It's one thing to say food yonder, but there's, there's gotta be more to it than that. Right. Absolutely. So it's not just a matter of presence absence, right? Strawberry, no strawberry. Um, it also has to tell something about the quality, right? So you can imagine that it's a tiny little tip of the strawberry that fell on the ground versus, you know, a little ways off, somebody dropped an entire half of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And so you want to have a way of sort of prioritizing where do you send more individuals? Do you send them to that tiny crumb of the strawberry or to a half a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? So what happens is as individual ants are out foraging in the environment, they're looking for food. And if they find more than they can carry back themselves, they want to go back and recruit additional individuals. Well, when they get back and they share that information through this care, these pheromones and their excitement of their sort of body language, additional individuals will follow them back. But what happens is if the additional individuals that follow them back to the strawberry, if they took five individuals with them, but it only took three to carry the strawberry back, two are coming back empty handed. And even if the three who don't know that the strawberry is now exhausted are excited, only three are really excited where two are not very excited where the ones that visit the strawberry, all five are super excited and say there's a lot more food back there. So then they're gonna take, all, even if that three to the strawberry still takes an additional five each, the same thing is gonna happen for the, the peanut butter. And soon you're gonna have this situation where it's almost like a positive reinforcement. But as soon as the individuals come back, there's some information about the quality and quantity of that food source just by the sort of interactions of those individuals once they come back to share information everybody's coming back with some so there's exactly for them let's go try our look at it exactly okay. that's so cool and so everything that we've talked about so far today is not what you actually study correct <laughs> not really yeah so what do you do yeah so I do kind of two things I try to sort of understand the evolutionary history of ants themselves and much of the way that I do that is I spend time out in the field so what that means is I often go to tro remote tropical places try to sort of study ants in their own native environment but almost all of the work that I do research wise is actually DNA or genomics based so when we bring the ants back to the lab either dead or alive we're often trying to study some aspect of their sort of evolutionary history through the lens of DNA or genomes so we might be sequencing whole genomes to study aspects of genome evolution. We might be studying pieces of their DNA to understand the evolutionary family tree of ants. That's one aspect of what we do. The other aspect of what we do is we try to understand how symbiosis might sort of benefit or hurt the evolutionary you know, history of ants or their ecological interactions. So a lot of what we study is the bacteria inside their guts and how that actually has helped them switch onto novel food sources. And so how 
do you find out this stuff from an ant that's this big? Like, it's easy enough, I think, easy enough, uh, to get DNA samples from a, you know, a mammal or something like that. You could take a blood sample, you could take a cheek swab, whatever, and there's enough stuff in there that you can break it down with chemicals and run polymerase chain reactions and wave right. your hands a little bit, and voila, you have some of its DNA sequence. Ants are like that big. Yeah, like, so it's pretty similar. I mean, you have to remember that we can have uh, professionals go into a crime scene and they'll find a flick of something and they can actually determine what individual left that behind. It's the same technology. And so really we can take an individual ant and grind it up, or in some cases we can just take a couple of legs and grind it up if we're only interested in the ant's DNA. Now, of course, sometimes what we wanna understand is sort of the distribution of those bacteria across the digestive tract. So there, if we grind up a whole ant, we don't know where you know individual bacteria work. So that actually does require a very careful dissection. Um, and so you really are sitting at a microscope, looking at an ant that's been magnified by orders of magnitude. You have these little fine forceps that are called like watchmaker forceps. And you're gently teasing apart the parts of the body so that you can individually test different parts of the digestive tract to see if there are potentially helpful bacteria there. I feel like people always talk about how surgeons need steady hands. Do you just kind of laugh at that? Like, <laughs> well, I've never done surgery and I don't actually want to, so I can't. But you will that. tonight. That's the surprise of the show. No. Um, so but I will tell you that when I do dissections on those days, I can't drink coffee at all. And I love coffee. And it's because even though I have very steady hands, I've never noticed that they shake. Once you get under a high powered magnifying, you know, a mag microscope, if you've had coffee, you can see the difference. Wow. So tell me about what's inside of an ant. Like they're, again, so small. I have trouble picturing them containing anything. Yeah. So remember before we were talking about how insects have a head and then a thorax and then an abdomen. Mm -hmm. In most insects, at least in ants, we'll just stick to ants for now. The majority of their digestive tract is all in the abdomen. So although the digestive tract starts at the mouth, and there is an esophagus, it just passes through the thorax all the way into the abdomen. But once we get inside the abdomen, it's actually quite complex. They have structures or organs that are very similar to our stomach, our small intestine, and our large intestine. And there we call it the midgut, the ileum, and the hindgut, or the rectum. And it literally has ten, many of the same functions, where we have most of the digestion occur at least starting in the midgut. We have a little bit more digestion occurring in the um, ileum. And then in the rectum, we have essentially more water um, uh, excretion happening. So just like our digestive tract. So when we study the bacteria, if we expect them to have some functional role in sort of increasing the dietary um, resources for the ant, we'd expect to find them more concentrated in the midgut and the ileum or in those parts of the digestive tract that are responsible for digestion. And that's in fact what we do see. So I know that in humans, we have tons and tons of bacteria living in our guts and without them, we're pretty useless when it comes to digesting food. Um, and you know, by better learning about what we have living in our guts, we can, you know, help with human health. I take it you're not trying to like cure Crohn's and ants here. Like, what, what are you trying to do by opening up ants guts and learning about the different kinds of bacteria that live inside of them? Yeah, so I'd say there's sort of two answers to that question. One of which uh, I fundamentally believe in the importance of basic research. And although I know that lots of research has applied outcomes, and I do think it's important to study things that are beneficial to humans, I don't think that that's the only kind of science we should do. We should do a lot of science that is just sort of trying to understand the world around us. Now, interestingly, the majority of the, the scientific discoveries that have helped humans actually started as basic research findings, which then we then figured out actually had implications to sort of an applied aspect. Now, in my work, most of it's totally focused on basic research. I'm just trying to understand the natural world around me. I want to understand how did it come to be? What is it doing now? And so thinking about things like the gut microbiota in ants, we have made some important discoveries. We've been able to demonstrate that herbivorous ants or ants that feed only on plant-based diets only can do that by having bacteria in their guts that 
upregulate their diet and synthesize essential amino acids that are missing from their diet. So even though it may not necessarily be the case that we can see an application today, there are downstream ways in which we might use this to better understand how socially interacting organisms share microbes, whether they're beneficial or whether they're parasitic, whether they contribute to things like um, investment in different structures of the organism, which might be beneficial to humans. And I should be clear, I don't give a shit about humans. Um, so <laughs> that's... She said it. Uh, <laughs> so I'm with you, like basic research, we've had our shot and we didn't do so hot with it. The ants can have this earth. Um, so what kinds of things are you hoping to learn with nothing more as your goal than to understand how the planet and all of its inhabitants came to be? Yeah. So I, I truly think that the diversity of forms and shapes and functions on a planet is just astonishing. Um, and, you know, I don't believe that there's any individual scientist who's going to sort of crack the code and figure it out. But we're all contributing meaningful bits of evidence to help us understand how it all came to be and what impact sort of the changes we're creating on the planet could have. Now, that being said, for me it's specifically, what I want to try to understand is how did ants get distributed across the globe? I mean, they're about 150 million years old. And so how did they sort of disperse across every continent? They're found everywhere except Antarctica. And, you know, how do we sort of explain that diversity? I also want to try to understand how did all the different shapes and structures on them form? How do we have some individuals that are, you know, have spines and some don't? Um, I also want to understand how does symbiosis or their interactions with other organisms in the environment explain the diversity we see? Is it that some ants that are herbivorous but have gut bacteria have been able to occupy new niches and, and feed on novel food sources? Is that what allowed them to diversify? And then what happens at the other end of the spectrum if you're entirely predatory and you're not incorporating any plant material in your diet? Do you still need bacteria in your gut? And the hint is yes, although we haven't investigated that enough fully. Cool. So you mentioned ants have been around for 150 million years, so that's like stegosaurus times that's a long time ago that's not even like recent dinosaurs um ants have been around for so so long and tell me a little bit about their evolutionary history like where do they initially come from how did they wind up on every continent except antarctica yeah so we don't for certain know the origin of ants um, some work initially even out of my own work has suggested that maybe the neotropics have been super important but some more recent work we've been engaging on it says Africa might be pretty important. So we don't know for sure. What we do know is that ants are old enough that they were on the continents before they started breaking up and that we have some that truly follow that Gondwanan pattern, meaning that the ants that are each other's closest relatives are on continents that were actually physically touching, you know, during sort of, you know, more than hundred million years ago. So there's some ants that, there, the two relatives are on South America and, and Australia, and those were physically touching before they split up. And so what we believe is happening is that there was you know, a more widespread species. And when I say widespread, I don't mean like across all the continents. It just probably had a distribution that was you know, bisecting that, that line where the continents split. And as those continents drifted apart from one another, those ants began to slowly differentiate through evolutionary time, right? So they started accumulating random mutations that eventually they became so distinct that even if we were to reintroduce them together, there's been so many changes across their genome, they probably couldn't even reproduce anymore. And so we're trying to really understand what happens through time. What does the sort of geologic history tell us about how ants came to be, as well as what their DNA is telling us? Awesome. And so you mentioned that one of the things that makes ants extremely cool to study is there are so many different cool kinds of ants doing cool stuff. Um, I know whenever we have a paleontologist on the show, we'll ask, like, what's your favorite dinosaur? They'll be like, well, I couldn't possibly choose. You know? um, I would like to know, tell me some good ants, Corey. Oh my God, I, so many better cool than ants. I will love to tell you about so many cool ants. In fact, I will share my screen to tell you all about cool ants. Hell yes. Um, so let's see here. Although this picture is not all that dramatic, it's actually my very favorite group of ants. This is actually a hollow stem. So this is a, a twig that was on a tree. And inside the hollow part is a group of ants living called the turtle ants. And the reason I love these ants is they have really cool gut microbiomes. 
Um, they're herbivorous. They're super diverse ac across the New World tropics. Um, and in this case, you can see this little individual here, that's a scale insect that they're tending inside so that this thing is producing sugar water that they're feeding upon. Now, Could you, let's, let's get into that yeah. a little bit. What, sure. what? What, what? <laughs> yeah, what? Um, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of ants, like a lot of humans, have a, a sweet tooth or a sweet mandible, I guess we'd have to say, uh, that they really are attracted to sugar sources. And part of that is because, of course, it's delicious. The other part of it is that adult ants, if you remember in the very beginning, I told you they're made up of a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. But one of the characteristics that makes ants unique is that they have a very slender waist. Um, and that slender waist means that as the digestive tract passes through that, any item that goes through must be small enough to pass through that very tight constriction. And so in the case of ants, that means as adults, they can't feed on solid food items. They can drink any kind of a liquid source. So if they find sugar water in the environment or a dead insect oozing something, those squishy ones you don't like, they like them. Give them to the ants. But the reason that, that we see that tight constriction is to, to give them flexibility to move their bodies. But the larva, which are essentially just sacks with mouths. That's me right now that. in quarantine. <laughs> I think that's all of us in quarantine. Right? Just like eight <laughs> snacks a day. It's amazing. <laughs> Minimum. Oh, but, yeah. So they actually can eat large solid food items. But so lots of ants, when they're out in the environment, if they can get access to any sugar source, a liquid sugar source, they're very keen on it. So probably if any of you have, you know, are gardeners and keep roses or know people who have roses, ants are the bane of the existence of people who keep roses. And it's not that the ants are actually doing anything to the roses. The ants actually have no interest in the roses. What they're interested in is the sap sucking insects, the aphids and things that live on, on the roses. So hemipterous insects or sap sucking insects are these insects that essentially have a stylus or a beak. It's essentially just a straw on the top of their head. And all they do is feed on plant-based sugar water. So what they do is they stick their beak into the plant and then tap into that flow of sugar water happening in the plant. And so if the equivalent of you and I would be as if there was a fire hose and we super glued our lips together with a straw and then stuck the straw in, the water pressure would be coming in and at first we'd be very excited if we were thirsty, but soon it's coming so fast you can't even drink it quick enough. So lots of hermipterous insects have modifications to their digestive tract. So just like most organisms, they have their digestive tract that passes through their esophagus into their digestive cavity where some of the resources are extracted and eventually the waste leaves the body. But many of these sap sucking insects have a bypass valve. So if the liquid food source is coming in too fast, it can essentially bypass the digestive tract and go straight out the other side, almost completely untouched. So it's almost as if it's just coming out of the rear end exactly as it was in the plant. So those insects produce what's called honeydew droplets from their, their rectum. And lots of ants actually have figured out that this is a cool, quick way to get access to delicious sugar water by just going up and taking care of these, of these sap sucking insects. So in the case of some aphids, the ants not only sort of take advantage of that sugar source, um, which then gives them a free meal, but in return, they're protecting these aphids from any of the predators or parasitoids that are trying to kill them. Now, in many cases, this symbiosis, the, the behaviors have become so complex that at the end of a day, the ants actually will physically carry that little sap sucking insect down to the base of the plant. They've built a little special retreat or structure, kind of like a tent at the base of the plant. They tuck them in at night, walk off to their own nest, and then come back each morning, pick them up, and re herd their cattle back to the green pasture. And interestingly, if that plant starts to sort of die or not produce as much liquid, they'll actually move their cattle to a new pasture, a new plant so that they're constantly you know, producing this sugar-based resource for them. That is more care than I received as a human child. That's <laughs> I hope your mom's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so ants have pet aphids. Can you go back to your screen now that we know oh. what you're talking about there, where it's inside the log and there's an aphid or log, twig, everything's, what is a, what is a log but a very big twig exactly. with them? Um, so that little white blob there is an ant's pet aphid. 
that's a scale insect, but they do exactly the same thing. They produce, so right now this one has its mouth part inserted inside the plant. It's sucking the plant resources and the ants will take advantage of the honeydew that's produced out of the rear end. But what's also interesting sort of thinking about the biology of ants is this group of ants. These are the Dracula ants. Um, and I want to credit right now, all the photos you've seen are have been mine, except this beautiful one, of course, because I'm not a professional insect photographer. This is by Alexander Wild. Um, you should absolutely visit his website if you have an opportunity to look at cool ant photos. But this ant is a Dracula ant. And so you remember I was telling you before about how ants go out and they are gathering food in the environment to feed to their larva. And that the larva essentially sacks with mouths. And that's exactly what you're seeing. So here's the mouth of a larva. And this is the elongated body. So they don't have any tight constrictions yet. They can eat anything. So the reason that most ants are actually carrying those dead insects back to the nest, so you'll see them bringing a cricket or a caterpillar back to the nest, that's to feed the larva. And this group of, of, of ants here actually feeds on, you can actually see the body here of a type of, of centipede, and that's all they eat. And this individual here is wrapped around it with its mouth parts and gorgeous. <laughs> and um, the reason they bring it back to the nest is to feed the larva. But you can imagine that some of the adults in the colony, especially the queen who's constantly laying eggs, does need protein in their diet. And usually when they're out in the environment, all they're finding is sugar water. So in the case of Dracula, in most ants, when they bring that food item back to the nest, the larva eat it, and then the queen or workers, if they need protein in their diet, they go over to the um, larva and they drum on the a larva with their antenna, sort of just like banging them. It's a little like physical signal, then the larva will regurgitate some of that food source to the adults. So it's just like we see in birds where we have sort of the social food sharing, but here instead of the adults feeding the, the young, the young are feeding the adults. Again, economical and good. But this but is where it gets work. crazy for Dracula ants. So they bring that food source back, just like you're seeing here, they feed it to the larva, but the larva will not regurgitate any of that food back to the adults. So how do the adults actually take advantage and get access to that resource? So what they engage in is feeding on their young. That's why they're called Dracula ants. What they do is they bite a hole in the integument or cuticle of that um, individual and then lick up the exuding hemolymph for blood, which is where they get their name. Um, but it's actually considered non-destructive non -destructive cannibalism because the uh, individual larva will continue to go grow and actually eventually emerge as healthy adults. So this individual here, you can see the bite marks here. You can see the bite marks. Yeah, here. yeah. This one here. And so they, they can get fed on multiple times in their lives, yet it still doesn't seem to harm them. But that's actually how they share the resources through the colony. Amazing. That's so good. So let's see. We got a couple minutes longer before we're going to bring Noah back and he's going to uh, give us some audience questions. So I would love to know, uh, one of my favorite things to ask scientists, you got any funny stories from the field? Anything funny or gross? <laughs> sure, of course, who doesn't? Um, I've been really fortunate because I've been able to do field work around the world. The tropics are my favorite place. I've done a lot of field work in South America, Central America, Asia, Australia, Africa, even the US, and I love it. And most of the time it goes very well outside of every now and the occasional illness. But um, one time I was in the field in Africa and maybe like, I, I actually am a terrible field biologist and that I break all the rules. And, and I don't mean that, that I put myself in harm's way. It's that if you're in the tropics and you're really susceptible to chiggers as I am, rule number one is don't lay on the forest floor because you're <laughs> going to get covered in chiggers. But yet I can't seem to remember this because as soon as I get to the field, I get so excited about everything I'm seeing. I'm more or less just laying on the forest floor looking at get it. In there. But so I had gone to the field in Africa um, and we were collecting ants and maybe like the second or third day in, my nose started to really bother me. And I was like, gosh, it's really bothering me. So one of my colleagues was with me that I know well. And I said, I hate to ask you this. I was like, but can you take your headlamp and like look inside my nose? Cause it's really bothering me. And he's like, what? I'm like, we, I don't want anybody to see, but can you look inside my nose? So he's like, all right. So he looks inside my nose. He's like, there's nothing wrong with your nose. And I'm like, okay. Well, that night we go, you know, everybody goes off to their tents. I get into my mosquito netting and I'm like this digging around. This is really bothering me. So the next day I didn't even think about it, but you know, I must've been like totally messing with my nose. And he's like, 
so your nose is still bothering you? And I'm like, yeah, I think I made it worse. He's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, last night I got in there. He's like, Corey, don't put your fingers in your nose, especially because we're in the tropics in the field. It's not the most clean place. So I was like, okay, okay. So then like a couple days later, still bothering me. And he's like, did you keep your fingers out of your nose? I'm like, yeah, but maybe I introduced something in there now. I scratched it up and it's infected. And he's just like, keep your fingers out of your nose. So it's low grade bothering me, but I kind of forget about it. So a couple of weeks later on the flight home, it's starting to really bother me again, but I'm on a plane. There's not anything I can do about it. So as soon as I get home, the very first thing I do is I go to the bathroom. I literally, this is the first thing I did. It was bothering me so much. I look at my nose and I put a flashlight in there and I look inside and there's an engorged tick Go! so large that's almost blocking my entire nasal passage. So I'm like, oh my God. So I like run around, I'm ripping open my collecting bag and all my gear that I just brought from the field. Cause I'm trying to find my little fine forceps um, and my like magnifying glass, my little hand lens or loop. And I run in the bathroom and I reach in there and I pull the tick out and I run and I throw it on my kitchen counter. And my roommate's like, what are you doing? Throw that thing in the toilet. And I'm like, no, I need to see if the mouth parts are still connected <laughs> to the tick or if they're stuck in my nose. Cause I need to know if that's gonna cause problems. So I look at the tick and of course it doesn't, it's mouth parts are attached. So I feel fine. Was your roommate an entomologist? What? Was your roommate an entomologist? No. Hence why they were like, throw that thing in a toilet. Yeah. <laughs> so I take a picture of the, I put the tick in some alcohol. I'm a collector. I like museums. So I take a picture of it in the alcohol and I text it to my friend immediately. And I'm like, I told you there was something wrong with my nose. I just inadvertently smuggled a tick home. And he just laughs at me. And I said, don't you have a colleague? who studies African ticks, ask him if he wants the specimen. So he's like, I'll ask. But in the meantime, I decided to tweet about it. And so I tweet like, I just accidentally smuggled home this tick from my nose from this remote field site in Africa. And one of my colleagues who's a, a lab-based microbiologist is like, um, you're essentially like, you know, a real like explorer. And I'm like, no, just because I brought a tick home my nose, I'm not necessarily a real explorer, but I like that you think so. Indiana Jones here. Yeah, exactly. Indiana Jones like. And so my colleague says, Hey, look, I asked my friend, they're not interested in your tick. So I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll put it in the collection of the museum. But before I could even do that, the next day he emails me and he's like, no, he wants your tick. And I'm like, why? What's going on? He's like, read this paper. And so a paper had just come out maybe like four days before where somebody described a whole new genus of ticks that belong to a family of ticks that only attach to the central portion of the nasal cavity of mammals. So lots of ungulates, elephants, they all have ticks inside their nose in Africa that attach only to the central part of the nasal cavity. So this paper was describing this new genus of ticks that had been described because it had been brought home by a biolo field biologist who had gone to the same part of Africa I'd had. And they only had one specimen. So this colleague, he was like, I have to have it because you have the second known specimen <laughs> of this entire species that I accidentally smuggled home. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. So Corey, why the fuck do you want to do this job? <laughs> I mean, you this know, this is that, not good. <laughs> yeah. But when you're out in the field, I mean, the things you see are just, you know, there's not words to describe how amazing it is, both the animals and the plants and, and getting to meet all of the scientists from the countries you visit and collaborate with them for decades after. I mean, there's nothing better. I, you want to send me like your resume or something? I can ask around if anyone's hiring. Because, <laughs> uh, okay, despite, despite the tick up the nose, this does seem like, you, like it seems that you enjoy it and isn't that reward enough. Oh, but, I love it. Um, <laughs> no, I have but, the best job in the whole world. <laughs> that's not possible because I do. So who's driving this <laughs> car? Um, <laughs> but uh, that's really awesome. Um, man, you're just, uh, you're living the dream. I am. And oh. I also want to give a special thanks for you wearing your Hymenopteran brooch. Oh, thank you. It's very cool. Oh, it's I, a necklace, even better. It is a necklace. Yeah, I was going to wear, a. I have two B blouses, but they were like, I don't know. I felt like they didn't translate well on screen, so. <laughs> I approve. So I have to do a lot of work here. It's very difficult. <laughs> um, but speaking of people who have to do a lot of very difficult work, is Noah Crookshank around? I'm back. He's back. Uh, and I too was, I have a butterfly shirt, which is not, I know it's on ants, but flying insect. 
and uh, you know, my daughter is fast asleep. She's four months old, and I'm not gonna fucking wake her. Um, <laughs> just a bad, bad, bad idea. Um, and um, thank you, Corey. I'm gonna start as I usually do with asking my own question because I'm a monster. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, when Kate and I ate bugs because we did eat ants. That was part, you know, we ate grasshoppers, um, scorpions, which I've eaten multiple times and freaking love. Twitch chat, scorpions, they're really good. Um, <laughs> but we ate ants and I don't know what kind, they looked generic, but I am not an entomologist nor do I you know, have any idea about the differences in ants. So I could not tell you remotely what the species was, but um, they tasted um, like blood, I'd say, or like raisins a little bit. Like it felt really irony. Okay, no, no, I'm gonna stop you right there. Raisins and blood. Yeah, I got that kind of know. iron, <laughs> sort of irony. That's what, I don't, I told you this at the time that we ate these things. I was too traumatized from the gusher caterpillar. I don't remember anything from that point in the evening on. Just, just um, a side note for everybody. Like, Kate right. actually made a mug of the two of us eating these things together because she <laughs> was so disgusted and I enjoyed myself so much. Anyway. We, so was like our, our, our boss took a video of us like each doing a shot with, or like I think just eating these little caterpillars. Yep. Were there sh shots were involved with scorpions. And yeah, Noah's just like crunch on his, having a grand old time. And I look like a Victorian woman who's seen the personification of death. I'm like, <laughs> it's a grasshopper. It's coming uh, no, I pulled you. that still and printed it on a mug for him. Anyway, um, my question is about the taste. That kind of irony, bloody taste. Like, is there a <laughs> just about the, um, about the makeup of the ant's body is that, um, why are we, ta why did I taste that taste? Do you know? Well, it's hard for me to say for sure since I have absolutely no idea what species you had, but I think one of the things you have to keep in mind is that many ants are essentially these little bundles of, of uh, little organs that make chemistry, right? And so you can imagine that's how they're communicating. They're also making venom. And so maybe the combination or cocktail of all those chemicals is similar to raisins or blood. Not that I would necessarily put those two in the same category, but now maybe I will never forget that. You know what? I just realized another thing that upsets me. You're a monster who prefers raisin cookies to chocolate chip cookies. But you have a Dracula this, ant. This is fucking Dracula. Look at him. Look at him. Have you been feeding oh, off of your, your new baby? Part of Canada, awesome. are you from Transylvania? <sighs> uh, okay. Thank you, Corey. So I'll, I will, um, uh, everyone on the chat, please, if you have other questions, uh, I know some of you have sent some in, I'm gonna scroll. I can't promise I'll get to all of them, but I'm gonna try and pick, uh, I'm gonna try and pick a few. So, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm still not over the raisin blood thing. Yeah, that's pretty bizarre. I have to it's, agree with it's you. It's the that. like, it's it's not like a full, like it was the the kind of, um, it's the irony aspect of it. I don't yeah, think there's a lot of irony in here. Irony. irony is that we're friends. Um, no, oh, like, oh God, as, fine, Kate, as in tasting like iron, anyway. Doesn't matter. Okay, so first, <laughs> Corey, this is actually how it goes live too, just FYI, except <laughs> usually I shit talk Kate in the middle of the conversation as well. Um, so first question, speaking of eating ants, um, the question is, so eating ants is a delicacy. Does that endanger any species or is most queen ant eating sustainable? Yeah, as far as we know, um, most ant eating is very sustainable. It doesn't appear to be causing any harmful impacts on the populations. Um, except in one case, and they're actually sort of not necessarily going after the ant. Uh, th this is funny that we actually landed on this. So there's a group of fungi that are called zombie fungi that actually take over the behaviors and brains and bodies of other insects, right? Is this Orphocordyceps? It is Orthocordyceps. Oh, Shout out to Matt Nelson, so wherever he is. And so there's actually, and it's funny because I actually have two pictures that are related to this. Um, there's a group of ants from um, uh, the old world, so in Asia and in Australia, that's this group of ants. I actually have a student who works on them. This is Polyrhachis. 
it's not this species, but within the same genus, there's a, a, a species that's parasitized by the zombie fungi. But people in this part of Asia actually believe that that fungus um, has health benefits. So they've actually been collecting so many of them that it's actually thought to be potentially harmful, both for the ants, but then there's also other species and caterpillars. But interestingly, I have this one, did I include it? Oh, I didn't include my little photo of the parasitized. Oh, I did right here. Can you see that? Not yet. Okay, so I need to reshare my screen, that's why. So let me go to this. Oh shoot, I have to figure out how to do this. Stop sharing and then start sharing. I am seeing it, I'm seeing a picture on the Twitch, but I think it's the same one. Okay, this one. Yeah, I no. Go, yeah. Corey, tell us what's happening to Yeah, this sorry. So head. anyways, there's this fungi that enters the body of them, takes mm -hmm. over the body and then sprouts out the back of the head. Um, but in doing so, it actually changes the entire behavior of how the ants move in the environment to preferentially help the fungus reproduce. So these ants are taken over, like it controls their brains. It makes them do things they wouldn't normally do. Um, there's a whole horror film and book about this, The Girl with All the Gifts. It's, it's all right. Better concept than stylistic writing, but what are you The game, do? The Last of Us is also, it's like the idea is that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. take That's over true. humans and just fuck everything up too. So. Yeah, so we have ample evidence from a book, a movie, and a video game that this is a terrible idea. What health benefits could possibly be like? Who would say like, hmm, this is a zombie fungus that's taken over the ant's brain and sprouted out of its head? Well, it's like fast and it. suit. It's or the rhino horn, right? I mean, a rhino yeah. horn is just fingernail, and yet people claim that it cures all kinds of things. There's no medical it's evidence. A but... <laughs> it's deeply bad. Okay, well, that's interesting. Thanks for the question. Even the question. Yes, that was still oh, but are, are we making any ants extinct? Are we endangering any ants by eating them? Uh, not by eating them. By destroying their habitat, for sure. Um, so the, there's a question uh, that came up while we were talking about vampire ants, which was, will ants feed, um, will ants feed the dead of their own species to their larva? No, and interestingly, there's some very unique behaviors in ants in that when an ant dies, it starts letting off a kind of acid, uh, a chemical from its body, an oleic acid. And other individuals from that colony, when they smell that smell on an individual, will pick it up and carry it outside the colony and deposit it in the trash pile. And what's interesting is that scientists have shown that if you take a living ant and paint that on, even though it's walking around, Every individual that encounters it in the nest picks it up and carries it and drops it in the nest pile. Even though it's wiggling and moving, they drop it in the dead grave and then it walks back in and they keep doing this until eventually that chemical ev evaporates off of the individual. So the response is so strong to the chemical that they ignore other information like the individuals moving around. And that's to make sure that if that individual died by some kind of a parasite or a disease, it's not spread throughout the colony. Um, what else you got for us, Noah? Hey, I got, I, Nan, Nancy's coming in hot. Nancy's got a long one, so, so bear with me. So uh, she's in Mexico right now, and all of a sudden in Mexico, there was an explosion of flying ants. Uh, then it was over a couple of days later with car carcasses and wings lying all over the place. What the fuck just happened? Was that, real, uh, or was that a really short mating season? How does that work? And why are they even mating if the queen has had enough? Star, 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 for five to 50 years. Nancy, you can write fucking, it's fine. We're adults here. Also uh, come in three letters, Nancy. <laughs> and there can't be more than enough, uh, uh, more, uh, more than one queen. So many questions. Yeah, so um, it sounds like it could be, a, mate, it could be a, a mating flight for ants or it could be a mating flight for termites. They kind of behave similarly. They go in these bursts. Um, and it's kind of like spawning in the ocean. If you've ever seen how animals spawn in the ocean, they release a lot all at once and very few actually both reproduce, but also survive. And the same thing happens here is that they release thousands of individuals just hoping that a handful will actually, you know, make it all the way through to their reproductive stage. So interestingly, when it becomes time for reproduction, 
individual ant colonies need to release their reproductives at exactly the same time because that decreases the chance of reproducing with your siblings, right? So you don't have inbreeding. So when the environmental cue for each species could be different, but when that environmental cue goes off, every colony releases all their reproductives at the same time. They go off in these mating swarms. And remember, one of the things that happens is that the males mate and then die right away. So you would expect to see a lot of carcasses of the males, but also a lot of the females are actually not successful and they're also dead on the ground. So I don't know how big the ants she was looking at. If they were quite large, they could in fact be the leafcutter ant queens, which in Mexico they eat and they call them noku, um, but they also eat them in lots of other parts of Central and South America. Um, we even have a, a subspecies that are found in the US. So they're really an amazing group of, of animals. Awesome. Uh... Thank you. I got one more I'm finding. Please, people keep sending them in. Also, I need to apologize to Nancy. It turns out that Twitch had censored her. It was not herself. It was <laughs> it was Twitch. So I should not have casted dispersions. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. You're very good at spelling the word come. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. Um, wait, I just saw it. Sorry. Um, can carpenter ants kill trees? Um, that's a good question. Uh, typically, I mean, of course they can. Typically, they rarely do. Um, of course, they're sort of burrowing through the material and, and you know, causing um, stress to the tree. The biggest problems we have actually have is in, in homemade structures, right? Because there they can actually weaken the, the structural integrity and actually lead to collapse. Um, in many cases, you know, carpenter ant colonies, when they infect a tree, the tree might be quite large. So really the chances of them bringing it down are small. If, if they do, it, it, it can happen. It's not as common in nature. They're more of a problem for human-made structures. Uh, okay, so termites also, someone's asking about termites also farming fungus. Um, and the question is, are ants and termites related? I'm gonna amend that slightly. Um, how close on the evolutionary tree are ants and termites? Super not close. Okay. Um, I mean, they're both insects, right? And so in that sense, like, yeah, they share 40 million years of evolutionary history, but actually termites and cockroaches are very closely related where ants are related to bees and wasps. So they're very different. But interestingly, early on, because they're so similar in their be behavior and biology, people called termites, the common name for termites were white ants right? Because they could see that they did lots of similar things. And I like that they brought up that termites can farm because if you listen closely when I was talking about ants being the world's first farmers, I think I said something like they're the world's first farmers or pretty close to the first farmers. It turns out they were the world's first farmers until, this until these scientists found out that these termites farm and this group of termites is actually older. So termites are probably the world's first farmers. <laughs> So you're lying to us, is basically what I you're had a caveat in there. I said I'm one other lies as far as told. <laughs> <laughs> Can trust nothing. Exactly. A <laughs> uh, couple more questions, and then I I do have one more question myself. Forgive me. Um, someone asked, "What is the hot take on murder hornets?" Which I know is not your. Um... Did we freeze? Did I lose my um, friend? I'm not frozen. I heard the question. If you guys can hear me. I can, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so the murder hornets. Wow, that's a tough one. Um, there's a few things going on there. A lot of entomologists don't like the common name murder hornet, of course. Um, and in their native range, they're actually not problems at all, right? They're only problems when they get inadvertently transported around the world by humans. Uh, and so there's that problem, number one. A lot of people, entomologists prefer to call them like Halloween hornets or something to make, talk about their cool colors. Uh, I am not an expert on that. And so I would actually recommend doing a little searching around on Twitter. Uh, I think Gwen Pearson has done some nice work on, um, on social media, dispelling some of the concerns around murder hornets. So uh, I, don't, I hate insect hate, so I like to proliferate insect love. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a long one too, so bear bear with me here. 
Um, Kelly uh, says, says, I read a Tumblr story about a study that had scientists strapping stilts to ant legs to test how ants track how far away things are. And they found that the extra long legs caused the ants to overshoot their target. Is that just true or a fun Tumblr story spreading ant lies? Is that my best friend, Kelly Bush? If it is, hello, Kelly Bush. It if is. Not, friend, Kelly. Oh, Kelly Bush. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Um, it's actually true. It's based on a real scientific peer-reviewed publication. And that what the scientists did is that lots of ants actually figure out where they are by either putting you know, trails that they can follow, pheromone trails, or they'll use visual cues. But you can imagine if you're in a really arid environment that's very flat, there's not a lot of visual cues. And if you lay a pheromone trail, it will dissipate very quickly. So people want to understand how do these ants find their way back to the nest so quickly? And so they had hypothesized that maybe the ants actually count their steps. So to test this, they did a lot of studies where they sort of put food at different distances away and showed that the ants actually could always figure out how far they were back. Then they did two things, one of which is they actually put stilts on the legs of ants and then showed that they overshot it. But this is where it gets gory. They also took individual ants, let them forage out for the food, picked them up, cut their legs to make them shorter, put them back down. And then when they walked back, they didn't make it far enough because if you're counting, your legs are shorter now. So you don't actually make it back to the nest. So it's not just a Tumblr story. It's actually true science and even gorier than you imagine. <laughs> but, but how could they like, I, I'm sorry, I, I need, I need more information. They cut their legs and the ants were like, great, I can just keep walking. Like the ant struck the structure of the ant legs is such that like, you can just snip off the bottom and they can still function. Kind of. Have, you've probably seen crabs where they've lost a leg and they'll just keep going, right? It's the same idea where they lost a claw. I mean, of course, like, you know, I'm sure that they probably feel some small amount of pain and it probably does cause some amount of physiological damage, but not enough to, to cause the organism to, to stop being able to exist in the environment. Now, would they live long term, like months that way? Who knows? And especially in an arid environment, maybe not, but it's for science. <laughs> uh okay are uh ants are farmers and ranchers can you tell us about ants being gardeners by dispersing seeds too oh absolutely so interestingly there's a lot of interactions between ants and plants and in most cases the ants are really benefiting more than the plants right so they're feeding on plants indirectly. They actually do steal pollen in some cases. They're not good pollinators. But the one service they do really well for plants is they actually disperse seeds. And what that means is that plants have figured out that if you can take advantage of ants in your environment, you can use them for seed dispersal. So a whole group of plants, I think it's something like 11,000 species of plants from over 100 plant um, families, have evolved this mechanism for creating what are called aliasomes. So the seed itself looks like a regular plant seed, but coated on the outside is this little fatty body that the plant produces it specifically to attract ants. And what happens is that once the plant just drops its seeds, the ants come and find it and they say, oh, look at this delicious, fatty, little yummy food. They drag it back to their nest, they eat off the little fatty food body, then they take the, the seed and put it in their trash pile. Now this is great for the plant for two reasons. One of which they've stuck it in this little trash, this compost pile, which is a great place for plants to grow, right? We even use our own compost to help plants grow. But in addition, they've essentially reduced competition for resources between the parental plant and the new seedlings by pulling them away so that they're not competing and there's a higher chance that that seedling will actually succeed. Uh, okay, one looks like we got one last question. Um, this isn't about ants per se specifically, but I know that you're really involved in increasing diversity in STEM. What are some of the barriers for women, minorities, and underrepresented groups in science and specifically in myrmecology? Did mm -hmm. I pronounce that correctly? Oh, those are great questions. Um, of course, it's not a simple one solution answer, right? Because if it was, we would have done it. Um, unfortunately, there's lots of things that are holding people back. We know that um, we don't have enough sort of role models for individuals across many groups within science and even in lots of fields in society. We know that there's not always good mentorship happening. We know there's not always equal access to resources. 
Um, we also know there's not always equity in pay, even for the same jobs. So I always say that part of the thing about those situations is it's more than a single problem, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's the constant barrage of ways in which you're not sort of accepted or included that actually will hold people back. So really what I try to do is work to find ways that we make everyone have an even playing field and that everyone can be at the table and that people recognize that diversity brings innovation and it brings novel solutions to problems and it brings new perspectives to sort of help solve some of the biggest questions in science. Um, so one last question, um, obviously we're not doing this in person. Um, what's it like being you know, a professor at Cornell, uh, being an active researcher right now? I mean, how, have you, how are you keeping going and, and doing the work at the moment? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting time. Um, unfortunately, many of my days are spent on video conferencing, which is not the way that we typically like to interact in science. Um, I've had to switch my class to online instruction, which is not how I plan to teach. Uh, but in addition, you know, I supervise a whole group of amazing researchers that are trying to, to forge their way in their scientific path. And so we've been trying to think of creative ways that if you can't be in the molecular lab or you can't be in the field collecting data, how can we ensure that your sort of scientific progress is continuing? And so there's been a lot of creative solutions and we're hoping that we get out of this mess soon, but recognizing that we have to be safe and socially distant as long as it's required. We freeze. No, I sorry, just a moment. Just have nothing to say. Nothing, strangely. <laughs> well, if that's the case, then uh, should we call it a night? Yeah. Corey, thank you so much for joining us. You are the coolest ever. I really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy quarantine life. Uh, which sounds like a joke. It's not like I've never been busier than I am right now. I'm guessing you are in the same boat. Um, so thank you, thank you. And I and don't think you're wasting your life even though you got a tick up your nose. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much. It's been really fun to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Hideout, for putting this on. Uh, I think we mentioned earlier there's ways where you can uh, add a tip for this talk, proceeds will go to the hideout and help support them through this shutdown. They have been just amazing, amazing uh, hosts for us and we want to do anything we can to give them a little bit of love back. So thank you, hideout. Thank you, audience, for joining us. Thank I I just want to also like affirm Corey. Corey has been, for both of us, she's been a previous colleague of ours and has been so game to just do random stuff with us. I once put Corey beside an ice luge full of ants <laughs> where she would talk to just like random drunk people about her and work. That wasn't even for work. No, that was just for fun. <laughs> so Corey's amazing. Follow her on Twitter, look her up. Uh, her research is incredible. Coevolution is is just mind blowing and, and we just got a taste of it tonight. So please also follow her. Corey, uh, aside from Twitter, is there any other place where people can um, make sure that they are uh, getting up to date on the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm mostly a Twitter person, but of course, like keep your eye on the web. I do talks, I do SciComm events from time to time. So I'd love to see people there. Awesome. All righty. Well, I think with that, thank you so much for joining us. Sign up to our mailing list. Um, you can email us at a scientist walks into a bar at gmail.com. And uh, if you have any questions, we have a website, a scientist walks um, We'd love to hear from you. We'd love you to tell your friends and keep it going. I was telling Corey, um, you know, when the show is in person, we kind of have a cap at how many people can fit in the hideout. But right now, like, I think it's just however many people can be on a Zoom call. So uh, tell your friends, tell people far away, tell your enemies. And uh, yeah. Thank you and good night.